at Felixstowe docks. The four-wheel drives were about to be loaded onto ships going to foreign ports. They've been stolen from homes around the UK, including addresses in Hertfordshire and Essex. 73 vehicles have been recovered in total. The six-week-long operation was carried out by officers from the east of England Regional Intelligence Unit. A former MEP has gone on trial accused of falsely claiming more than £30,000 in expenses and spending it on fine wine and cars. Tom Wise, who represented UKIP and lives at Lindslade in Bedfordshire, denies the charges of false accounting and using criminal property. His researcher, Lindsay Jenkins, who lives in London, faces similar charges. The case will continue tomorrow. Two bodies have been found in a garage in Great Yarmouth. Police were called to Hall's garage in Camden Place at around lunchtime today. They found two men dead at the scene. Officers are treating the deaths as unexplained, but they haven't ruled out a suicide pact. Now, the M1 motorway celebrates its 50th birthday today. Roads Minister Chris Mole unveiled a plaque at the motorway's first service station, Watford Gap, in Northamptonshire, to commemorate the occasion. Well, when the road first opened, it started at Junction 5 near Watford in Hertfordshire and ran to Junction 18 near Rugby. Well, it now stretches from Brent Cross in northwest London all the way to Garforth near Leeds. Well, Neil Bradford is at the Watford Gap services for us tonight. Neil, first let's clear up any confusion. Where exactly is Watford Gap? Well, of course, it's in the county of Northamptonshire, close to the village of Watford, not far from Daventry. The gap refers to the natural break in the hills uh, on the Roman route from the Midlands uh, to London. Now, you may, know, may not have known where it was, but you certainly would have known what it was. This was the first motorway service area in the country. It was very popular among touring musicians who used to meet up here, and it was so talked about in the music world that it's uh, rumoured Jimi Hendrix thought it was a London London nightclub. Now it's been the focus of much of the celebrations today as the M1 turns 50. In half a century, the M1 has both frustrated and fascinated those who use it. For today's motorists, it may well be a source of annoyance, but for the drivers of 50 years ago, it was the source of amazement. Impossible, they said, just as they did in Stevenson's day. Ridiculous, they'll never do it. But they did, because we're driving along it now at 70 miles an hour. Post-war Britain needed an icon of modernity and strength, and the M1 was it. Six lanes of tarmac, 72 miles long. Such was the enthusiasm for the M1 that a public inquiry to approve it lasted barely half an hour. It wasn't long before the country's first inter-urban highway revolutionised travel and trade. With the arrival of the motorways, there were now brand new high-speed roads which were much safer for driving trucks, commercial vehicles. Back in the early years, the M1 would have been full of cars like this, a Vauxhall Cresta, built, of course, just down the motorway at Luton. But neither the cars nor their drivers were used to such high speeds. And nor were the AA. The organisation was a world apart from how it is today. The saluting motorcyclists soon made way for the motorway patrol. When the M1 first opened, AA patrols spent all their time dealing with cars that had simply overheated. Believe it or not, at that time, there was no speed limit on the motorway, and cars just weren't designed to drive at those speeds. From day two of the M1, Stan Hallard went on to spend his entire AA career patrolling the motorway. He recalls how different it was. There was no hard shoulder. It was just imagine um, a sea of mud, with, with um, a lawn floating on the top. The birth of the motorway also led to the birth of the motorway service area, and Watford Gap in Northamptonshire was born. The Blue Boar, as it was known then, became a regular haunt for the pop stars of the day as they toured the country. 60s singing sensation Dave Berry remembers it fondly. My first tours uh, were with Dusty Springfield and the Searchers and people like that, and then on the following years with the Rolling Stones, and uh, we all stayed here. We tended to meet the newer bands as well. It was a, a genuine meeting place. 
The M1 was originally designed to cope with around 13,000 vehicles a day. Today it carries over 10 times that number. It now runs for 193 miles with 48 junctions and 12 service stations in total. So what of the future for the backbone of our region? 50 years ago to the day that Transport Secretary Ernest Marples first opened the M1, his modern-day successor unveiled a plaque commemorating its place in history. We're going to see some exciting technology that we've already trialled on the M42, coming here to the M12, giving us additional capacity when we need it most, when the roads are busiest. We're going to be able to close lanes, control speeds, and do everything that keeps the traffic moving as smoothly as possible so that people don't have interrupted journeys. Where the M1 once offered speed and freedom, many now dread its delays and congestion. There's no denying its importance in the history of our region. Well, Neil, that's the nostalgia. What about the future of the M1 then? Well, of course, it was only designed to carry 20,000 cars. It now uh, uses 140,000 cars every single day. Now, the AA predict that by 2025, uh, Traffic will be running at 50 to 60 miles an hour during the peak hour if nothing's done. The government say long-term widening like we saw down at Luton is out of the question. They favour more things like hard shoulder running and controlled uh, widening of the motorway. Thanks, Neil. Stay with us here on Anglia tonight. Up next, all the news. Well, more news now, and a Suffolk man who severed his arm with a chainsaw has had it successfully reattached. The 38-year-old from Noddishall near Leyston is in a stable condition after undergoing surgery at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital. He was airlifted there on Friday after injuring himself while trimming a hedge. The number of children being referred to Suffolk Social Services has soared, according to county council figures. Last year, referrals rose 11% to 7,000. But in the six months to the end of September, that figure was already nearly 8,000. Police referrals account for the majority of the increase. A Norfolk teenager who learned to cook while undergoing cancer treatment in hospital has been crowned champion of ITV's Britain's Best Dish. Murray Grant from Norwich wowed the judges with his strawberry souffle creation. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? And our own Jim Rice has been to sample the dish for himself. They say if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Well, 14-year-old Murray Grant can definitely stand the heat. Today, Murray's in the kitchens at City College in Norwich, where he's studying for a Level 1 National Vocational Qualification in catering. But on Friday, he was in London, being crowned champion of ITV's Britain's Best Dish for his strawberry souffle with cream panna cotta and strawberry coulis. Murray's souffle! I couldn't get my head around that, you know, out of 3,000 people or so that had entered, I'd won the whole thing. Murray's route into cooking is both surprising and inspirational. Aged 11, he was diagnosed with cancer. It was during his treatment at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge that he sampled the cooking of Mick Law, the children's cancer ward cook, and a love of food was born. He said to me, you, uh, you cook anything? And I said, yeah, yeah I did, within reason. And uh, he says, oh, I'll have a souffle. I took it down to him and he was asleep. So his dad ate it. So I had to make another one another day, which he did eat. If you want to have a go at making Britain's best dish, here's what you'll need. 200 grams of sugar, the whites of two eggs, and a small punnet of strawberries. And if you're very lucky, or a very good cook, it should turn out something like this. Believe me, it tastes every bit as good as it looks, but what's Murray got planned to try and top his top dessert? I think it's sort of time now to start thinking about other dishes, maybe something to do with pasta. If the souffle is anything to go by, whatever Murray creates next, I can't wait to try it. Jim Rice, Anglia News, Norwich. Oh, me either. Lovely.